Hey Oasis, these are your announcements. This past year has been rough on all of us, but now it's time to spark love back into your marriage. Whether you've been married for 15 years or more, or just simply 15 days, Spark Marriage Conference has something awesome to offer you and your loved one. So join us for the Oasis Spark Marriage Conference. To get all the fun details and register today, go to the website oasisphx.com spark. Oasis is offering two very unique educational classes to help further your journey with the Word of God. Our first class is a class called Foundations. This is a class designed to give you the foundations to the faith. If that's something that you'd like to be a part of, then sign up at oasisphx.com slash events. We meet every Sunday at 10 a.m. in the Adult Mod here on campus. Our second class is called Apologetics. This class is designed to help you go deeper into our faith, being able to defend it using the Word of God. If that's something that interests you, you can join us here on campus Wednesday nights at 6.30 p.m. in the Adult Mod. Sunday Fun Day is a great way to spend time with your family and stay social with your friends and even invite new people onto our campus. This month's Sunday Fun Day takes place January 31st on our campus out in the field. We'll have food trucks and music, giant Jenga, giant Connect Four, giant checkers, and so many other larger than life games. Needless to say, it's gonna be so much fun. So join us January 31st from four to 6 p.m. here on our campus. We can't wait to see you there. Thank you so much for your generosity. When you give to Oasis, you're helping us to continue building the kingdom of God. We wanna make it super simple for you to give, so you can text the keyword give to the number on the screen, or you can go out to the kiosks out in the lobby, or you can go to our website underneath the Give tab. Thanks again for all that you do. And these were your morning announcements. Now it's time for meet and greet. So sit back, get ready for worship, and tag a friend to watch along with you.
online I am so excited for what God is going to do in and through you and I do not believe that this is by accident that you are watching us and that we have this message and worship prepared for you today so we're gonna go back into worship but before we do I just want to quickly talk about the really important message that Pastor Billy is preaching today and it's titled why the Bible matters See, there's so many different things in life that we think, okay, this is important, this is important, and we kind of put them in a, in a little box, right? And the things that aren't important, we just kind of throw out and we go, maybe it's somewhat important. But I, I'm here uh, to, to tell you that when you listen to Pastor Billy's message, I think that you are gonna understand just how important the Bible is and how much it matters. Uh, he's even gonna answer all the questions of like, well, is there even proof on the Bible? And so if you have any doubts in your mind, I want you to uh, really take notes. I know I say it all the time, but take notes and listen. And if you have any other questions, make sure that you DM us at any point, at any time of your life here at Oasis Online. We are here for you um, all night, all day, and we're ready to talk to you. So thank you so much. Gather your family, get ready for more worship and a powerful message. And thank you for being a part of Oasis Online. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run. The fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, 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 it's a key.
is holding on to me. God is holding on. When the night is holding on to me, I know God is holding on. Cause you are good, good. Hey, welcome to Oasis Online. Glad you're taking the time to be with us today. Whether you're listening online or watching this, I'm glad you're taking the time to be with us. We're in a great series called What's the Matter? And uh, in times like this, there's a lot of people that are finding things that are matter with all kinds of parts of their lives. But what really we're really digging into is the things that matter supremely within our lives. And today I'm going to be talking about why the Bible matters. You know, we live in a time in our culture where uh, selective truth is what matters. Personal truth is what matters. And the question we have to ask ourselves, is there a supreme truth or a supreme authority that if followed can have massive impact in our lives? And I say today, the reason the Bible matters is because it is the picture of God's grace and goodness toward our lives. And you know, some say that everyone has the right to their own truth. Um, but I want to challenge you that if there is a book that declares truth that has the power to have life change. And the question we ask when we talk about the Bible, we say, is the Bible truthful or is it authoritative? Is it is something that we can say, wow, that's the truth. And because it's the truth, I can follow. Um, some people say, well, it's so old. How do we know it's not changed over time? And they, they ask the question, well, is the Bible reliable? Is it something that, you know, did, did stand the test of time? What, is what was written back when it was first written still written today? Um, you know, and some people say, well, when I read it, it's too hard to understand. It's a waste of my time. And besides, is it even relevant today? I mean, it's an old book written in old times. I mean, does it make sense today in our, in our day that we live in to follow the teachings of the Bible? And there are other people who say, well, I don't follow the Bible because it's not scientific. And uh, to all of those things, I'll say this, first of all, it's completely, the Bible is not unscientific at all. As a matter of fact, uh, it goes right along with the idea and concept of science. But there is one thing I want to tell you today about the Bible. The Bible is the only book that will help you make your life make sense. It is true. I mean, today in the crazy times that we're living in, it is a book that deals with the reality of what life is all about, where you came from, where you're going, what's going on in your life. It is a book that deals with truth, justice, equity, equality, sorrow, suffering, things of the spiritual life, things of the spiritual life. It is a comprehensive book on how to live life well. Um, what to do when you find yourself in the best of times and what you do when you find yourselves in the worst of times. It is a book. It is a revealing book. It, re it really speaks to you about your purpose and about your destiny, about what to expect in life and how to live a life that's worth living. Uh, here's something that is equally significant. The Bible is the only book that can bring hope back into the heart of someone based on an eternal truth. 
You know, do you find yourself hopeless today? You know, there are, I think, a lot of people, even some Christ followers, that have found themselves hopeless. And I would say it's because we're not connecting to the words of God and the life that come from finding the words of God inside of us. It is a book that truly impacts lives. It is, it is a book that transforms the lives of people. And here's why. The Bible is the story of God's interaction, connection, and desire for humans on the earth. It's, it's the book that tells us about our own design, about the reason of our creation, the purpose of our creation, how to live in this earth with one another and in relationship with God. It's, it's God's divine love story to man. God made man to embrace them, to be, walk with them. Man, in our natural way, we wreak havoc in our own lives and create brokenness and sorrow and suffering. And God, in his design, is inviting us back to himself. And we struggle with the love of God, receiving it, but also learning how to love God back and how to make this life significant. And I, I want to say the Bible is the, the book that teaches us and tells us how this interaction works. It's a book that has the power to change our life. And if we can see the power of this book and allow that power to begin to impact our lives, we realize that people that have had their lives transformed by the Bible live significantly different lives. As a matter of fact, they have the power of sacrifice. You know, I'm reminded of the story of William Tyndale, who was a Bible translator. His life had been so impacted by the grace of God, he wanted to pass this message of hope on to as many people as he could, and he would find languages that people didn't know. And as a matter of fact, he was writing and translating it into the English language. And, uh, and, and, and a part of his writing, when he was translating into the English language, he wrote some things about the king of the time that were unpleasant. The king didn't like what he was writing because he was giving a biblical worldview. And the king was upset. He fled the country, uh, but eventually was captured and brought back to the, to the uh, kingdom where he was in England. Uh, and the king had him killed. And his dying prayer, his dying wish, is that his prayer would, that the king would be impacted by the words that he wrote, the Bible that he was translating, and eventually come to Christ. And sure enough, in his death, the sacrifice of his, of his life to, to tell other people about the value, the transforming impact of the Bible, that king did come to know Christ. I want you to know that that sacrifice, the value of that sacrifice, was found because of the transforming, powerful effect that the Word of God has on people's lives. So I want to start this conversation with this question. Is the Bible reliable? Is the book that I hold in my hand and the scriptures that we read in here, are these actually the words that were written by somebody else a long time ago and they've maintained? Because, you know, many people I talk to will say this, but the Bible is so old, you know, it's been changed over time. Everybody that's had an opportunity to change it to suit their needs or their time frame has done so. Uh, but I want you to know that we have an opportunity to do some scientific investigation, to study the internal evidences and the external evidences of the Bible to find out, is it reliable? Is it actually something that we should consider putting our trust in or finding the truth in there to discover how to learn those things. Um, you, know, the, you know, the Bible is the number one best-selling book of all time. It sold more copies than any book in history. You know, every year it's the number one selling book. It's, uh, it's been the number one selling book for so long, they don't even put it on the top sellers anymore. A hundred million copies a year get sold. But the question isn't, isn't popular. It's, can I trust it? Can I, can I trust the reliability of the Bible with my life? You know, when you see... Um, shows like on Discovery Channel and magazine articles that talk about the Bible. Many times they're coming with the questionability of, can we trust this? Is it reliable? And they throw questionable conversations in there, get people that maybe don't uh, buy into the belief of it. But we're going to actually do some study today or digging into the idea of, of scientific evidence of why we can put our confidence in the writings of the Scripture. Um, some people just assume the Bible isn't true because of some of the stories that are in there. The Jonah and the whale, the, the parting of the Red Seas, and the idea of a supernatural God engaging humanity on any level just seems far-fetched. But when we begin to realize that he truly is a supernatural God, and many of the encounters that people have had with God have been of the supernatural type. Even when Jesus was on the earth, people that attribute to the life of Jesus and the value of Jesus that has seen not only his teachings that were so powerful and authoritative, but the power of his influence and healing of people and miracles that took place that made his word so much more significant. Why? Because, well, God is a supernatural God, and there must be an embracing from a, a natural sense into the spiritual sense that God has the power to do things that might seem out of the contrary. The idea of Jesus walking on the water, we know is not natural, but is it possible? Is it possible that a supernatural being can influence and affect the things in the natural? And I would say, of course, when we think about supernatural stuff and all the shows that are out there now with your Supermans and all those things, everybody goes, well, yeah, if that was true, 
So the question goes back again, well, is the Bible a book of truth and history that is reliable to put our um, hearts into? Let me say this, the Bible, I believe, is historically accurate and divinely inspired. In other words, it is telling a real story of real people in a real time that actually can be checked on because history has places where people lived and people that lived there. Archaeology can discover those things, but and it's divinely inspired. The idea of uh, this claim of divinity that God is actually speaking to humans throughout through the words of the Bible to encourage, to inspire, and to transform is something that we as Christ followers believe with all of our heart. And I know many people struggle with that identity. Even Christians struggle sometimes with the idea that the words of God are divine. But I, I want to invite you to the reality of what Scripture says uh, about itself, the proof of its own self. It says this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, um, in verse 16, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Listen, inspiration simply means this, that the words that were written were God-inspired. Now, we know men are fallible, but if God was to say something to someone, to tell somebody else, they'd have to probably write that down. So the idea of the words being inspired are that God spoke, he uses man to write, and man writes the, the words that God spoke. And the idea of biblical inspiration is, is the, the idea that God is communicating to man and wanting to get information to him. You know, Second Peter reminds us of the value of God speaking again in, in verse 20, chapter 1. He says, but know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. In other words, I'm not getting to make it up. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Inspiration is what happens when, when God speaks, God moved upon writers to write something down. We call that an inspired word from God. God spoke it, men wrote it, and he wants us as followers to follow it and obey it. Um, so what can we do to establish the validity of the Bible so that we can actually trust in what I call the reliable words of God? So we're going to look at two different contexts of, this, of the Bible, the internal evidence of the Bible and the external evidence of the Bible. The internal evidence is we're going to be talking about more things that are more difficult to say are provable. The external ones are going to be easier to prove, but the idea of them I think are important in discovery of understanding the reliability of Scripture. Um, because the evidence flowing from within the Scripture, or these internal evidences, are something that are, are what I call undeniables when we look around the lives of people. And I'll start with this. You know, some claim that the Bible is like the roaring of a lion. The authority that is found in the scriptures has such strength and such power that people are influenced by that. So I'll call this, the Bible has its own convincing authority. You know, Jesus, when he was with the crowds, speaking and teaching with them, it said, said in Mark 1, of him, it says, The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority not as the teachers of the law. Now, the teachers of the law were the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day. But when Jesus spoke, he spoke with an, an identifiable authority that made people, when they heard it, go, wow, that, that seems like God is speaking throughout the Old Testament, hundreds of times in the Old Testament. Uh, the, the scriptures say, thus saith the Lord, or the Lord was speaking, that authoritative mode of God communicating to mankind. It is God speaking himself. And so that authority, many times, when particularly when you become a Christ follower, you actually can sense the times in scripture where you feel the embrace of God communicating something specifically and uniquely to you. Um, so it's a powerful tool. But there's also something, and not speaking of that, there's evidence for us as believers of the witness of the Holy Spirit when we're reading scripture. It's a, it's a powerful thing when you're reading the scriptures and something, I call it this, comes alive. There's a spark, there's an in inspiration. You might call it an epiphany that happens and you're like, wow, this is God speaking to me divinely in this moment. This is something he wants me to apply in the moment today toward my wife, toward my kids, toward my boss. It's something that God speaks to us and communicates to us, whether it's about our circumstance, about the challenges that we're facing, a peace that he brings by a word that we hear. It's divinely Inspira divine inspiration that, that connects with us and there's a witness within our spirit. Um, Romans 8 says this, the spirit himself, in verse 16, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. There's this something that happens is when you become a Christ follower and you begin to read the word, something happens in us in connecting to the words of God that inspire and encourage us, which moves me to one of the most important factors of 
the internal evidence of the Bible is the transforming ability of the Bible. When people begin to apply themselves to read Scripture and to take that Scripture into the process of, I'm going to begin to apply it into my life, the power of transformation is amazing. I mean, it's amazing what happens when we apply ourselves to hear the voice of God. It's amazing what can change within us, what, what powers can be broken of addiction and, 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 and discomfort and sorrow and sadness. It's amazing what God can begin to do in our lives. Untold thousands of people have experienced the power of God over drug addiction, over uh, derelicts have been turned, their lives have been transformed, hate has been turned to love. Um, believers grow as they study the Word of God. I'm reminded of Hebrews 4.12 that says, For the Word of God is living and active. Continues, but I want to say it's living, it's active, it's, it's a vibrancy that we find. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to the dividing of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Man, think about that. The Word of God has the power to go to the innermost part of our beings, to separate out the stuff that doesn't belong so that we can see the things that do. It even judges the thoughts and intents of our heart, our attitudes. I mean, imagine that, the power of the Scripture to change our attitudes. You know, some of you are, are angry today. Could you imagine that your anger being turned into joy or peace? Could you imagine your sorrow be turned into comfort? Could you imagine your depression be turned into life? I, I want to know that the power of God's word is the power to transform you in a really, really special way. His word possesses a dynamic, spiritual, transforming power that if we would just simply put our heart into the reliability, the truth of the scriptures and say, God, I'm going to take these as my own, that power of transformation begins to go into play. It's that authority that comes into the scriptures. It's the evangelistic work that happens, the edifying powers of God that work in our lives to transform us, um, not just for us to see, but for others to go, wow, I, I see a difference. I, I have the privilege as a pastor to see lives change on a regular basis of people that I would say this, that they once were lost, but now they're found. They once were blind, but now they see. And, and because of it, they live differently. And their family says, you live Differently, People around them say they live differently. So, uh, But there's also another thing about the Bible that's significant on the inside, the, 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 the unity of the Bible, evidence of the unity of the Bible. Let me just give this to you. Um, when you study the Bible, there are 66 books in the Bible, written over a period of 1,500 years by nearly 40 different authors uh, in several different languages containing hundreds of topics. I mean, Listen, if, if you're dealing with anything in life, you're probably going to find a topic of it in the Bible, addressing and dealing with the, the best attitude, the best way to deal with that, the process of how to manage life's situations. It's in the Scripture. Um, and the Bible possesses an amazing amount of unity of theme, and significantly, the number one theme is the theme of God's story to mankind. It, man rejected God, had a sin problem. God had a, 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 a way to solve that problem through a Savior. We know that as we study the New Testament, that Savior was Jesus Christ. He is the solution. And from Genesis to Revelation, this unifying story of God's desire to engage man and save him from his trouble, to save men and women from the difficulties of what they were experiencing in dysfunction, to say, I want to bring healing and hope to you. I want to bring healing to the, to the sick. I want to, I want to wound, mend your wounds. This is the story of God's grace that we find in Scripture. Um, and it's amazing when you think about all those people that were a part of this, the unifying concept and message that they shared. Um, and here's important, important to notice. Not, not one, there wasn't a group of men that put the Bible together. It was through time as prophets came out, as historians came out and began to write, that people began in their time frames to put what they considered sacred scripts together. And over time, they were generated through the New Testament, which put our, our 66 books together uh, that we know of today as the Bible. So those are the internal evidences that we can look at. And again, you, you might go, well, yeah, so what? Well, let me give you some external evidences why I believe placing your trust and confidence in the scriptures that we hold is to be the living word of God and the kept word of God. Not change, but the kept word of God is so critically important. Because the internal evidence is based on inspiration and mostly subjective, but the external evidence is based on science and the discovery of, of how we look at other books of antiquity, because the Bible is truly a book of antiquity, you know, written 3,500, 4,000 years all the way up until the, the first century AD, uh, our scriptures were written. So we're going to look at the evidence from the historicity of, of the Bible, because much of the Bible is historical. 
Uh, and such, and such, it's subject to verification. It, you know, times and places and people and events that took place. If you can go back in history and see others that wrote about the same type of people in the same kind of places and the stories that basically confirm stories to be true and accurate or not true and, and inaccurate. So how do we look at those things? Well, we look at archaeological artifacts is one of the ways that we do that because in our archaeology we discover again all kinds of history as we unearth things we find as we learn what they wrote and the things that they were writing about we discover the history of the time but we also use documents things that people wrote during those periods of time to validate uh, what what was going on so uh, we're going to do that today so let me just go talk about archaeology for a second I just uh, this morning went back and looked at uh, you know discoveries of archaeology and it's amazing how every year new archaeological finds are happening that are proving stories and people in the Bible. Um, you know, for the longest period of time, and again, there's multiples of these that are, are happening on a regular basis. You know, the Pool of Siloam that we find in the New Testament, um, did, they didn't believe it existed. Archaeologists said, well, this place doesn't exist. We can't find it anywhere in Jerusalem. You know, the story that Jesus encountered this man. And uh, just a few years back, we discovered in, in an in, in a archaeological dig the Pool of Siloam. The Hittites that we uh, are found in Scripture, not mentioned anywhere else uh, in, in the analogs of our time. We thought that the Hittites were only a man. A, a, many people thought that the Hittites were just made up by people in the Bible until we unearthed and discovered more fragments from a different culture that was writing about a people called the Hittites. And again, these are just proofs of the context that what the Bible is writing is about actual people and actual places and events that took place. And it's important for us to understand. Donald Weissman wrote this. The geography of the Bible lands and visible remains of antiquity were gradually recorded until today more than 25,000 sites within this region and dating to Old Testament times in their broader sense, have been located. 25,000 places have been unearthed or things have been discovered as it related to conversations and communications in the Bible. Um, you know, much of the earlier criticism of the Bible has kind of gotten waned because of all the discoveries that are happening on a consistent basis of information that is only found within the scriptures. Uh, and we're even talking about to, to, to the writing of Moses' time and history of what took place in the earliest writings of the Old Testament. Um, so it's important for us to understand those things, and I think they're valuable for us as we begin to look at our archaeology. Um, but we also have something called uh, the written documents, what we call uh, the scriptures that we have, right? These are, these are writings that people wrote in, in time frames way in the past. We, we call them, and again, we have it in a form that doesn't seem so old, but these are all books of antiquity, writings from times long gone back. And, and there is actually scientific um, expectations that happen when you look at books of antiquity. Go, are these are these true? Are they real? Are are they accurate in what they communicate? And and scientists use different gauges to discover how to find out if these are reliable documents and they're real. Uh, they age uh, the authenticity of histor historic historical documents in two ways. First, uh, we need to find out the time span elapsed from when it happened compared to when it was written. And when the first copy was found. So, if, you know, if you wrote it today and someone found it tomorrow, that'd be a day. And uh, the idea of having that. And then if a copy of that, if someone said, well, you know, this is the day that it was, um, this is the day that it happened. This is the day that it was written. It's close together. And then when was that copy discovered? So I'm going to just kind of give you some historical understanding of some of the writings that we look at today, particularly for our understanding of Roman history. Um, I have something I'm going to throw up here to you so you can understand the, the power behind this. I think this is, this is important to understand how manuscripts work. Because there are many people, some of you today go, well, the Bible has to have changed because, you know, I mean, we're 2,000 away, 2,000 years away from even the New Testament when Jesus wrote and even farther from some of the Old Testament writings. So how can we trust the reliability of Scripture? And I want you to pay attention. This is really important because many of you go, you discount Scriptures because you say, and I've heard this many, many times, men have changed Scriptures. They've changed it to make it work to whatever they want. So if you'll look at this, these are works that we know have existed and we've used to kind of put out history. Tacitus was written 
um, in AD 100. The earliest copy that we have was 1100 AD. So that's a thousand year separation from when it was written to the earliest copy that we have. So it's a time span of a thousand years. And we have 20 copies of, of Tacitus, which that's not bad having 20 copies. You can kind of verify, make sure what was written in one is written in the other. And you can see that there is a substantial truth that they're all the same. Caesar's Gallic Wars, written 58 to 50 BC. Our earliest copy is 900 years, so that's 950 years between uh, the time when it was uh, first written and the time that we have it, right? So kind of a long expanse of time, the worry of it, and, and there's only 9 to 10 copies. And there's this, this significant one, Livy's Roman history, where we get much of what we understand of Julius Caesar and the time frame of the, of the uh, history of the Romans was, was actually found in, in we teach in our schools with this process of all these things. It was written in 59 BC to AD 117. Uh, earliest copy that we have is AD 900. Again, 900 years from the time that it was written. And we have 20 copies of it, right? And again, we base from a historical standpoint, we go, we believe these things to be true because of the testimony of the documents that we have. And even though they're quite far removed from the time frame that we would hope, we're still buying into the idea of what we believe about Julius Caesar and all the things that happened in history here. Now I'm going to go to the New Testament, which we see was written in AD, between AD 40 and 100, the multiple books that were written there. And the earliest manuscript that we have of the New Testament, these manuscripts, is AD 130, right? I want you to notice that. Uh, AD 130, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to think about. So the time frame, actually, between uh, the, when the last one was written is only 30 years difference in the time span between the earliest manuscript that was written and the time frame that we have the earliest copy. And here's the significant thing about the New Testament. In the early manuscripts that we have, this is how many manuscripts they have. And some of them are full manuscripts, some of them are partial manuscripts, but there's over 30,000 manuscripts that we have access to back in the time frame from, from 130 AD to 350 AD, 30,000 manuscripts of what we call the Holy Scriptures that we have in possession today. And I, I want to say the significance of this, because many of you, in the idea of your concept is, you know, I don't know if I can really trust the Bible because, you know, man's got a, his hold on it, and then maybe they've changed things over time. I want you to know that the Bible that you possess today, we can go back to only 30 years after the initial writing. And again, they wrote on papyrus, they wrote on different things that would fade, they had to rewrite and redo things. I want you to know how significant and powerful it is that to know that the Bible that you hold in your hand, we can go back to the earliest of these writings and realize that this is holding true to the original intent of the writers of the day. Now something happened significant back in, in, in 1950 or 60, I can't remember the exact year, um, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Now the book of Isaiah is an Old Testament book that the earliest copy that we had of the Dead Sea Scrolls um, was a thousand years, or almost, I think it was 1,800 years from the actual first time it was written. It was the time frame that we had was a long time away. And then we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls were um, discovered uh, around, I uh, actually went to the place in the Cuman community down in, in uh, off, just off the Dead Sea where there was a cave that was opened up. And in this cave was found a complete copy of the book of Isaiah. This copy was a thousand years earlier than the copy that we possessed. In other words, we had a copy that was, was found a, a thousand years later than the copy that we discovered, and we realized in a thousand year difference time frame, there, people were like, well, this is going to be so different over a thousand years. The, the trends, what's going to happen is going to change. And when they went into it, it was 99.5% the same. The things that were different were uh, the grammar that was used or some of the hyphens that were used, some of the put, put stuff they put into play. There was nothing significant about the difference from the Dead Sea Scrolls from the book of Isaiah to the one that we possessed in our hands that we declared is to be the word of God. And you say, well, so what's so significant? Well, it just shows you the value and the power of God's ability to hold true to the things that were written, prophecies from early on about Christ and when he would come and how he would come and the story of the redemption that he would provide, all found in the book of Isaiah. Prophecies about Jesus Christ coming and the, and the uh, power of those things. You know, F.F. F. Bruce, who was not a Christian, by the way, made this statement. He said, the interview the interval then between the dates of original composition and the earliest extent evidence becomes so small, speaking of uh, the New Testament manuscripts that we have, uh, he says, they become so small as to be in fact negligible. 
especially when compared to the dates of academically accepted historical documents, such as those detailing Roman history. The last foundation for any doubt that the scripts of the Old and New Testament have come down to us substantially as they were written has now been removed. Both the authenticity and the general integrity of these works may now be finally established and proved probably to be the most authentic historical documents known to man. Think about that. The Bible that you hold by someone who is a man, a book of antiquities that studies antiquities, and the Bible is probably the most accurate and, and historical document that we possess in our hands today. And it's a beautiful picture of the value of God's design to have, to have us hold a reliable description of his inspired words for us to grab a hold of. Um, and I just want to remind you of God's ability to protect himself and protect his word for our lives. Um, it, it's a beautiful picture. Um, that we're invited to understand. So we see the evidence of this, this uh, scientific study of, of, of scriptures of antiquity or writings of antiquity and how the Bible holds, no one can hold a candle to the amount of manuscripts and how close it is to what was written. Now we're going to move to the evidence in the scripture of fulfilled prophecy. You know, the Bible is one of the only books that actually has words of prophecy of things to come. And that when you study the scriptures, there is no... Uh, unfulfilled prophecy that had made a de declaration it was going to happen. There's some prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled that are about the apop apocalypse and revelation of the future, but no unconditional prophecy of the Bible and its events has gone unfulfilled. You know, if I was to declare to you um, that, you know, the lottery ticket for this next week is going to be such and such and so and so, and I was right, you'd go, man, this guy's got some divine, you know, understanding. Uh, he's got a connection. Well, I, I want you to know that the scriptures spoke multiple times of events that were yet to occur that sure enough came to pass just as they were prophesied. Uh, I share with you in Isaiah, the very nature of Christ's coming was prophesied of how he would become, where he would be born, how, what he would go through. Uh, you know, the Quran and, and uh, uh, the parts of the Vita that are the, the Indian, uh, in India used, they don't make any declarative or predictive um, conversations. They don't have prophecies of them, but what will be. Um, but as for us, the fulfilled prophecies that we find in Scripture are, are just an indication for us of the authority and validity of the Bible. And of course, then there's the easy idea of the evidence of the influence of the Bible. It is no more, uh, it's so broadly, it creates influence in our society, not just in American society, but around the world. You know, the Bible has been tra translated into more languages than any other book ever. Uh, it's published more copies uh, it has influenced more thought, inspired more art, motivated more discoveries than any other book that we know of. Um, its power and influence not only just changes the, the, the culture that we live in, but it changes the way that people live their lives. The influence of the Bible, even the Western culture that we live in and the way that we live has been driven by this Judeo-Christian value uh, of love, uh, of loving God, of loving people, learning to love life. This is, a, this is a contextual mode of what the Bible teaches on a regular basis. Um, civilization has been influenced in such a great w way. As a matter of fact, morality, the basis of morality, and again, there's a conflict with this today in our society. You know, society today is basically teaching this premises of everyone has their own truth and whatever your truth is, that's the truth. And the greatest sin in society today is to say, well, your truth doesn't matter as much as my truth. You know, everyone wants to be validated in their own truth and wherever they got that truth from, whether it's internalized or whether it's through experience to say, well, this is my truth. It seems that everyone's individual truth is greater than, than any other truth. And this is where the reality or the, the exception of the Bible's authority comes into play because it has the power to challenge what we would consider truths that we find in our own experience and why it's so important and imperative for us not to rely on our own influence. And again, you know, as a Christ follower today, someone who believes in the moral guidance of the scriptures and the power that it possesses to change and transform lives, it's difficult in a society that basically says there is no singular truth. And anyone that makes the declaration of singular truth is untrue in themselves because they're not validating someone else's truth. But I want you to know that our own truths won't produce for us the life that we need. Our own truths won't, at the end, satisfy the greatest that we have, which is a relationship with God from, from the very be beginning. You know, God and his inspiration to touch us, he inspires us to love. And again, morality we talk about in the scriptures, this design from God that he, he loves us and wants us to love one another, even at the cost of sacrifice. 
Do you realize that the context of hospitals and orphanages and, 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 and organizations that take care of the needy, the really inspiration behind that came from the Christ followers that said, listen, even when things are difficult, when the plagues happen, Christians would go to the places where the plagues were and open up hospitals. And even at the cost of giving their lives, and many of them did die to the plague themselves, but they went to bring the hope and foundation of Jesus Christ. Why? Because... God and his inspiration of love and sharing and making disciples around the world uh, with this love of God was a mandate and a call from Scripture that was powerful. I want to go to just a couple other things as I kind of move to close. And one of these things is the idea, you know, the Bible has been um, tried to be destroyed for generations after generations after generations. You know, every generation has someone that says, you know, the Bible is going to become obsolete. Um, you know, our generation, I know when I was younger, the Beatles said, you know, we're going to be more important than, than the Bible or Jesus. And uh, many have tried to get rid of the Bible. And in its early in, uh, inception, when the Bible was made, you know, uh, Nero tried to destroy all the Bibles. And, uh, you know, people tried to do so many things to destroy the Bible. But yet, the Bible continues to, to live on. It, it continues to be one of the most influential uh, books that is passed around. And I'll significantly say this, you know, I want to say this about the power of the writers or the authors, particularly of the New Testament. You know, the New Testament authors were eyewitnesses of Jesus' life. They, they experienced Jesus and his miracles. They heard his teachings. Um, but their writings, when they began to write about Jesus, their, the integrity of who they were and who they became led them to the place where they were told, listen, if you renounce these words that you've written about Jesus and about who he is, you can live. But quit preaching Jesus, because if you keep on preaching Jesus, you're going to die. And out of the 11 disciples that were alive, Judas killed himself, but out of the 11 that remained, only one of them was not martyred or killed for their faith by passing on this message of hope. These, these words that they wrote down, they were willing to say, listen, even if it cost me my life, it, it doesn't matter. This message is so important and so valuable and so viable for the lives of people. I'll pass it on even if it cost me my life. They had this value of, of um, integrity inside of them that said, I got to speak the truth. I can't, even if it cost me my life. And why? Because they were eyewitnesses. Just to give you a couple of uh, passages in the scripture of the book of Luke. Um, and again, this is the idea that the Bible is a historical document because the authors that wrote it were just simply passing on a truth that they were giving to the next generation to hear. Uh, in Luke chapter 1, the writer of Luke says this, insomuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word have handed them down to us, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you might know the exact truth about the things you've been taught. The writer of Luke was like, I, I just want to tell you what happened. I'm going to write a story about this guy and about the experience of this guy. And I, I'm, going to, I'm only writing it out so you've been taught how to live. But I want to tell you the story of the why. Why do you live this way? Because God, in his great love for man, sent his son to live a perfect life and who did tremendous things and said, I've come to heal and to save and redeem, but then gave his life as a sacrifice. True love. To die on a cross for our sins so that we could be saved and redeemed and pass that redemption and salvation on to the next generation. You know, Paul was one of the receivers of that next generation. He didn't know Christ personally. He, he came to Christ after Jesus died. But his writing, when he was writing to that next generation, he said in 1 Timothy 1, On my way to the province of Macedonia, I advise you to stay in Ephesus. Well, I haven't changed my mind. Stay right there on top of things so that the teaching stays on track. Apparently, some people have been introducing fantasy stories and fanciful family trees that digress into silliness instead of pulling the people back into the center, deepening faith and obedience. He was like, man, the word has got to stay true. We've got we to gotta keep the message of hope found in Jesus Christ as the centerpiece of the message that we're sharing. And I, I want you to know today, you know, biblical critics have regarded uh, the Bible as mythical, but archaeology has established it as historical. Antagonists have attacked its teaching as primitive, but moralists, people that find real morality, urge that the teaching of love is applied in a modern way, that it is still the power to change the world. And we find that even in our culture today, everyone says, listen, can't you just love a little bit more? You know, skeptics have doubt, cast doubt on its authenticity, yet more and more are convinced of its truth every day. Why? Because it's deeper than a word on a page. It is a spiritual emphasis and infl infusion from God above. His design was to give us divine words that would encourage and inspire us. So as I close, and again, 
There's lots to learn. We can talk more about scientific things. We're offering a great class um, uh, and at our church for those of you that are in the area to come and go to a class on you know the, the authenticity of the Bible, the scientific reality of the Bible, and, and how science and the Bible are co in cohesion together. They're not opposed at all. I'd encourage you to take the time to join up with that class on Wednesday nights. We also have a foundations class that teaches the value and principles of the scripture. Uh, but the question that people ask, well, is the Bible relevant for today? And, and listen, every week, I can't help, but I, I, I try to make the Bible relevant because I, I know this without a shadow of a doubt that the scriptures are for the way that we live our lives today. You know, the Bible, uh, some people say this, well, the Bible is a bunch of stories of goody two-shoes people who, who don't drink, don't smoke, and don't chew, and don't, goes with, don't go with girls that do, right? But it's not. You start in the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis is like watching the Jerry Springer show. I mean, there's so much dysfunction and so many troubles and problems and, and killings and, and infidelities and, and, and bad actions and bad habits and bad attitudes. It's, it, the people, the, it, if you read Genesis, all those people needed a therapist, right? Why? Well, because it's real people re living real life in this c context of being separated from God and God's desire to include himself in their story and giving them guidance and, and, and direction. And we see throughout the scriptures, God's engagement with man saying, listen, I know that life seems like this, but if you'll follow me this way, things things will be better. And the, and the concepts, the principles that we, we learn within Scripture are valuable principles of how we live life on a daily basis. The way I love my wife, I found in Scripture. The way I forgive other people, I found in Scripture. The way I discipline myself, I found in Scripture. The way I manage my finances, I found in Scripture. And again, not that there aren't other extracurricular things that we can learn and study and discover that help us in our life journey. But I want you to know living life and the value of how you live life, the principles of how you live life, are found in the context of the scriptures. And God invites every one of us to find and discover those principles, which, you know, one of my main goals in life is to help people discover the treasure of the Bible. Because you'll learn about God and his love for you. You'll learn about God and his design for you. You'll learn about God and his purpose for you. You'll learn about God and the things that you're dealing with, the troubles that you have, the insecurities that you feel, the, the lack of identity. You're, you can discover who you are, what God has called you to do, and the inspiration of that when you begin to discover the Bible. You know, the Bible is relevant. You know, when I find myself dealing with fears of any kind, I'm reminded in Scripture, 2 Timothy, it says that God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. And I go, Lord, because that's true, I put my trust in you, and peace comes to my heart. It's a relevant, practical application, and I could go after Scripture, after Scripture, after Scripture, because the Bible is relevant, the Bible is true, the Bible is powerful. And I, I just want to encourage you. You know, some of you have bought into the lie that your truth is equal to the truth, and it's not. And ultimately, our truths lead us to dysfunction and brokenness, but God's truth leads us to hope, to healing and redemption. I remind you of the scripture I read earlier in Hebrews 4. The word of God is active and alive. It can go and change the context of our soul. It ministers to our attitudes, our thoughts. It changes who we are. His way leads to life. Our way leads to death. Would you today make a decision and a commitment to say, you know what, I need to get back into the the reality of what the Bible offers, which is to know God, to know my design, to know my purpose. And some of you have said, it's just so hard for me. Don't buy the lie. The enemy's trying to tell you that there's so many ways for you to learn how to discover Scripture. And, and there are so many passages that you can go that can illuminate and give you strength. Now, there's some difficult passages in Scripture. There, there are some that, that people still banter over and over. But there's so many other places that we can learn and grow in. And as you begin to mature and begin to grow, the context of the whole begins to make sense. And you begin to discover even more truths. But you have to begin by saying, no, this is valuable, this is important, and it is necessary. It is God's word to me for living. Some of you have forgotten that principle to you. It's just a mandate, oh, I better read my Bible, check. Man, read to receive, read to hear, read to be inspired by God's grace. You know, for some of you, now's the time to kick into a, maybe a good Bible reading plan. Go to the New Testament and just start reading through the Bible. Hear what Jesus said, hear who he's talking to, the context of what he's saying to them, and apply it to your own life. What would he say to you if you were in that same situation or the situations you're in? What would he be saying to you? I want you to know there's so much that you can learn in Scripture, and I want to encourage you and inspire you that the words that we hold today are accurate, they've been held true. Um, and again, the things I gave you today about why we can trust the Bible are significant for your personal life journey. So make that challenge today. Get into the Word of God. Open up your heart to the love of God because ultimately what God wants is all of us to receive His love and 
the salvation and redemption through his son, Jesus Christ. Maybe you need that today. Maybe you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you're watching, looking for the hope, the answer of what's going to fix the whales in your life, the troubles. I want you to know it is Jesus and the hope that he offers you in forgiveness, a relationship with God. Maybe you need to give your heart to Jesus today. If that's you, would you pray this prayer with me? Say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to save me from my sins, to give me a hope for tomorrow, and to speak truth into my heart. God, I give you my life, and I choose to follow you today. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you. If you're a first-time guest, we would love to have an opportunity to connect with you and give you a free gift for joining us today. Or if this isn't your first time, but you're ready to get connected, go ahead and send me an email and let me know how we can best serve you. We have life groups, both live and virtual, classes and resources to help you live your life in complete freedom. And you know what? If you're ready for the full on-campus experience, you can reach out to us via email as well, and we will get you connected with an opportunity to check us out and meet our church. Thank you so much for watching and have a blessed week.